Yeah, it's page 10, right at the top. Yeah. But it starts, we remark that Chloe's image of her voice, her story, seems as fragile as a bubble. The group becomes quiet when we ask for responses or thoughts. Mm. So it's difficult to know how effective the interview, the, whether mm. it's due to this kind of, yeah. you know, yeah. like working metaphorically that kind of quietens the group and not actually how to engage with it, or whether there's, what kind of science it is, whether they're kind of contemplating and engaging mm. with something. What, what was your thoughts, Lynn? Um, just that it seemed to cover actively ensures communication is comfortable, uh, comprehensible, avoiding too much silence or interpersonal ambiguity. Mm. So you, I, yeah. I took that to mean that if they were slipping into interpersonal ambiguity and they made that intervention to mm. yeah. express curiosity about mind. I just thought it was kind of interesting about the, um, on page 12, the second paragraph on the right, the subtle mirroring found in these images we feel very significant in terms of mentalizing. So it's kind of, it's a reflection, like there's so many reflections in this, but I just thought it was kind of stood out to me. Something about being image focused, uh, um, and effect regulation, uh, externalization of different states of mind. There's quite a lot, you know, sort of sums up quite a lot. Mm. Mm. I mean, it's an interesting bit, isn't it? It goes on to talk about mirror neurons and mm. to mimic is to recognize the actions of another. Um, such a discovery also in part explains our feelings of intuition about our face to face relationships and why we get the feeling of empathy. Mm-hmm. But yeah, again, it's that's, that's very theoretical. I mean, I suppose yeah. I was thinking about because because this makes reference to the group, and what follows that is about the theory of um, mirroring, but, um, but what goes before that is uh, about the group experience. Yeah, it goes on to evaluate the mm-hmm. program. Mm-hmm. Which I don't know if anyone had any about the guidelines in here. In the evidence space. Yeah, yeah that's the evidence space. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean it, it's hard to select a. Yeah. It's almost like the whole of that right. section yeah. feels relevant for yeah. the. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, they're, using, they're using validated. Yeah, they, they're using yeah. measures. Yeah, and, yeah, and it's, um, it's local evidence, but it's absolutely the yeah. kind of evidence people are looking for. Yeah. So should we... The concluding paragraph on page 14, the results and the outcome of would essentially suggest that the combination of treatments was effective, with benefits sustained over time. That would, that would link with the um, uh, point one, wouldn't it, about mm-hmm. the uh, okay. evidence-based model. Uh, yeah, the conclusion on page 14, end of the second paragraph. Uh, our clients create a visual language and into a visual dialogue often, uh, often unspoken both with themselves and others. It's kind of a very generalised statement about the intentions of the group uh, and the outcome combined. Is there anywhere we want to particularly link it to? Um, promotes art as a central focus of the therapy, so being, yeah. yeah, being externalisation of the state of mind. And, also, whole and seven as well, facilitates uh, sort of joint viewing of art objects, different perspectives. It kind of does need to be linked with actual inter- interactions in the session because it's kind of generalised reflections on the session. We really? may not agree with the actual, but this does. We may agree, we may not. But, mm. That's why I think it's more kind of intention and their, and their reflection of the intention. So I just wondered if. Um, we conclude really sort of about thoughts. What what's emerged for me anyway is this this idea that um, the paper had a lot of observation and a lot of discussion, uh, but for our purposes, back to linking it in with what a what a therapist should do and what what don't, it it was hard to pin down. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's a lot of about that. Uh, patient experience and the kind of things that patients were doing in the group, um, but we're not sure what uh, what initiated or influenced those kinds of patient experiences. Yeah. yeah. Specifically. I'm not sure how easy it is to do either. Write a paper, to write a paper that's evidence-based and also very clear 
in, in the interventions? It might be that it is going to require a different style of, mm. of writing up sessions and writing up papers, because if we do want to really articulate what happens in a mentalizing session, you're going to have to keep working between the two minds. My mind thought this and said this, and then what was said back, and so you're going to want to keep actually being very... That's what mentalizing is about, being very explicit about that thinking process, whereas most of our writing is more observational, it's, it's kind of interpretive, um, and then what we may do with those interpretations and the transference and all those sorts of things, which is going to be a different style of what we're trying to, to, to draw out. Mm -hmm. So it is going to require a different way of articulating, which it seems, given there's not that many of those papers about, mm -hmm. we are going to just struggle with kind of inferring from the observations the therapists make, where they link as best we can to our guidelines, which I, which I think is still substantiating. I think it's valid, but we're not going to get to that, what does the therapist specifically say, perhaps. Yeah. Something, right?